Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans, your second chance to gain insight and advice from the best instructors featured on the Golf Smarter podcast. Great golf instruction never gets old. Our interview library features hundreds of hours of game improvement conversations like this that are no longer available in any podcast app. I originally did my my PhD dissertation on, on pre-shot routines. Really? While I was at the University of Virginia studying under Bob Rotella. So this is actually a, a, a sweet spot for me in terms of routines. But I actually take my students through and talk about what I think is the more important components and that's the mental side of the routine, the decision making that you're doing, the uh, feeling or seeing the shot, committing to the shot and the club that you have in your hand and then going up and being able to trust in your skills. So that breeds the consistency. Certainly having a physical routine can help breed consistency. But if you don't have a routine, then what's going to happen when you're up over the ball? With another interview from the archives of Golf Smarter, here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome to Golf Smarter for Members Only, Patrick. Thank you, Fred. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for contacting me. You actually, you are a golf podcaster as well. Is that not correct? I am. I have the um, Golf Psychology Podcast, which um, I try to do weekly, but uh, with my time demands of coaching, it ends up being maybe uh, twice a month uh, mm. that I can get it out there. Yeah, well, that's what happens with podcasting. It, it turns into a black hole once you get started and you're like, oh, wait a minute, I never wanted to be a recording engineer. I just wanted to put content out there. <laughs> and you st- that thing starts snowballing and then you get audience who start writing to you and you're like doing a lot more than you ever anticipated you would, right? <laughs> yeah, but it's a, it's a wonderful platform to educate people about the mental game of golf and uh, to give them some quick tips and uh, have them interact with me. So you're doing a couple times a month. How long is your show? Um, I do two versions of my show. I do an interview show, which is usually only about 15 to 20 minutes where I'll interview uh, an expert. But typically what I do is I'll answer a question from one of my readers. So um, they'll email in a question and then basically I'll sit down at the microphone and hammer out a quick answer for them uh, because I feel like, you know, sometimes they don't have the attention span where they want to listen to me for, um, you know, an hour long. So I hammer out a five minute uh, typically an answer for them. Um, and I, I have the sports psychology podcast as well, and I do the same format. I switch back and forth between an interview format and just a Q&A format. And what is the difference between your golf psychology podcast and your sports psychology podcast? Well, the sports psychology podcast is more general. It's not golf specific. And um, obviously, I open it up to other athletes that ask questions. And um, I also have a uh, Mental game experts. I interview other mental game experts that want to talk about um, sports psychology. Well, it's interesting. Do the questions that come in for other sports, do they also relate to golf or vice versa? Will you get questions about golf that can relate to any other athlete? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And vice versa. So yeah, any question I get from an athlete can be, you know, relate to golfers um, or it can relate to tennis players, hockey players. So yeah, um, I actually have, um, I'm, I actually do four podcasts out there. So I'm a, I'm what a, a stud. Podcast, <laughs> just like you, but uh, so, and it keeps me uh, pretty busy, but um, I have a full-time assistant that helps me as well. No, lucky you. <laughs> you have a you mean you have a real business going on and just yeah. your podcasts are just fun um uh so in regards to the questions that you get and it was interesting you said tennis yeah i can see tennis the mental game hockey there's a mental game part of hockey it's not all yeah. just, all just reaction <sighs> And, you know, any performance, it doesn't really matter whether it's hockey or golf or tennis or surgery or a surgeon or a musician. I get contacted by musicians and singers. Fred, I mean, it's just across the board, performance is performance. If you have performance anxiety, you know, or if you have fear of failure, it's going to affect your performance. So it it could be test anxiety. It could be stage anxiety. uh, It could be a golfer you know, that's worried about, um, you know, the first tee jitters and, and hitting a bad shot. So yeah, it doesn't really matter. Sports psychology can go even beyond sports. I, I think to, uh, any area when you're dealing with 
the mind and performance. Yeah, and I would think that the anxiety level leading up to, let's say, the drop of the puck or, or game time could could definitely have an impact on your performance in the game. But but golf, to me, um, there's so many opportunities during a round of golf that your mind can mess with you um, versus in a hockey, when, once you're on the ice, you're again, I think you're just reacting. Do you have time? Does the mental game get in the way while you're while you're playing? Well, you're right. On uh, those reactive type of sports, um, I think it is easier uh, for athletes to, you know, have a good mental game. But yes, if they start overthinking or they start overanalyzing their game or they're, they're worried or concerned about what a coach does, coach is going to yank me, you know, if I make mistakes. So it still applies even in those fast paced reactive type sports. Mm hmm. Oh, interesting. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have gone in that direction, but I I can understand uh, it's can it can hamper any athlete any performance. But I think you're right. Golf has some specific mental game challenges that come with it. The ball sits stationary, and that presents a challenge in and of itself because golfers can overthink and overanalyze what they're doing and uh, let a lot of negative thoughts and indecision come into play before they hit the ball. And then the other factor that you have is sometimes uh, you won't hit a shot for five minutes. And what do you do with the downtime in between shots? And then how do you get refocused if you've had a conversation? conversation with a playing partner how do you get refocused for your shot um and and having to concentrate you know so i think there's some um you could say some myths out there by golfers about concentration some rounds last five hours let's face it Um, a lot of my students on the mini tours uh, you know they'll be playing five hour rounds you can't focus for five hours in a row it's just it's it's simply impossible to um, have a high level of focus so that once again that requires the demands of being able to go in and out with your concentration be able to click it in when it's your turn to play be able to what I call relax your focus in between shots so um, that you can kind of I call it saving your concentration for the end of the round because not everybody can be Ben Hogan like, and, and and I don't know if Ben Hogan was able to concentrate for four hours in a row. You know, I I haven't talked to him personally, but <laughs> <laughs> he um it appeared that way. You know, it it appeared that he was completely focused on his game for the entire round, and I I think golfers make a mistake when they try to do that when they when they tr- actively try to be stoic and only focused on their game and try to focus. Uh, just straight through. Well, it, it brings us to probably the greatest example of our generation, and that would be Tiger Woods, um, where it, when he was in his earlier prime, and not saying he's not going to get back to that, hopefully we'll be able to see some some greatness again from him, but um, it, he was completely in a zone for four plus hours. It felt like, I mean, you're just watching it on TV. And now... Um, there's just seems to be distractions all over the place that uh, won't allow him to focus for that long. But you're saying that he wasn't necessarily completely focused um, for all that time, that maybe he was focused from the time he stepped, he got to the place where his ball was and then started focusing on, on when the shot was. Do you have any sense? Absolutely. Well, that's what, what I tell my students, you know, how long does it take you to do your routine? How long is it, you can do your yardage, you can get your yardage really with your eyes closed. I mean, that's pretty simple, just pacing off your yardage. But after you get your yardage, then there's some decision making that starts to come in, certainly with your club selection in the wind. And from that point to the point at which you strike your ball, it can be anywhere from 20 to 35 seconds at the most for a golfer that's playing deliberately. So uh, most people can focus for, you know, 20 to 30 seconds at a crack. And that's what I encourage my students is really know what you're supposed to focus on during those 20 or 30 seconds um, and try to immerse yourself in, in that routine and then relax, um, have a good time, try to enjoy yourself between shots. There's no sense grinding on your next shot until you get to your ball, you know, and then it's time to kick up your focus, have some type of a trigger, 
you know, I know some sports psychologists and mental coaches out there have, you know, suggested that you have some type of a physical trigger um, once you get to your ball to click it in. Maybe it's just pulling the club out of the bag, for example, or tugging your hat you know, tighter on or putting your glove on or something that indicates, okay, it's my turn to play. Let's get focused on only my shot and what I have to do. Let's let go of the conversation um, and um, just get into my routine for the next 20 seconds. So th- that's it. absolutely what I tell my students is you don't need to be focused for the entire period. You can click it in for 30 seconds at a time uh, relax your focus, try to have fun and enjoy uh, yourself on the golf course between shots. And then there could be verbal triggers as well that you to yourself, correct? Certainly. Yeah, yeah. certainly. Yeah. You're setting yourself up for that 30 seconds, you're 20 seconds, you're, you're behind the ball, you're visualizing your shot, you're, you're checking out what your target is, you're, you're, getting your confidence that you pulled the right club. Um, But what I see so frequently when I'm out on the golf course is people who don't get behind the ball. They don't necessarily have a routine and they do all their thinking while they're standing over the ball. Yes. Well, it's interesting we're going in this direction, Fred, because this is actually uh, my expertise. I originally did my my PhD dissertation on on pre-shot routines. Really? While I was at the University of Virginia, um, you know, studying under Bob Rotella. So this is actually a, a, a sweet spot for me in terms of routines. But yes, um, and I, you could say, you know, maybe you're high handicap golfers um, that aren't, aren't as tuned into the mental game are going to go through the motions physically. I mean, you certainly um, need to set up to the ball. You know, you need to find a target and set up to the ball, maybe take a practice swing at the very least. But often the difference between good mental preparation and no mental preparation is having what I call a mental routine and not just the physical routine. So you can separate them and you can look at it uh, from a physical standpoint of, yeah, I have to take a practice swing and maybe feel what I want to do with the shot. I have to align to the ball and I have to know where I'm going with it. So th- at the very basic level, but I actually take my students through and talk about um, the what I think is the more important components. And that's the mental side of the routine, the decision making that you're doing, the uh, feeling or seeing the shot, um, committing to the, the shot and the club that you have in your hand and then going up and and being able to trust in your skills. So that breeds the consistency. Certainly having a physical routine can help breed consistency. But if you don't have a routine, then what's going to happen when you're up over the ball? You know, you're going to have six different swing thoughts. Maybe you're going to have doubt and indecision come in easier for you. Um, So I'm a big believer that consistent mental preparation uh, is going to lead to um, much more consistent performance. And I think low handicappers and certainly professional golfers understand that concept. You mean we could just spend days and weeks and months talking about pre-shot routine and you're right on top of it, huh? Yep. Awesome. Yep. This is my sweet spot. Oh, I love it. Okay, well, let's keep going then because I um, have uh, – I try to practice uh, – uh, a pre-shot routine, whether I, you know, uh, with a with a long club or putting. I mean, I have two different routines there, um, and I know that I will not perform as well if I kind of rush through it or don't do what I do. Especially, even on on the putting green, my pre-shot routine seems to be pretty consistent, even with a, a three or four foot putt. I, I have to stay with it. And I apologize to my playing partners that sometimes it feels like it take too long, but <laughs> the, a routine seems to me uh, to be critical for, for any success in my game. Yeah, and I'll comment on that. If you're Please. concerned concerned that you're taking too long, then that's certainly problematic because then you're you're either rushing right through the routine or you're thinking, you know, I hope my playing partners don't think I'm holding them up. Uh-huh. <laughs> And in yeah. either case, that that 
to me is problematic. Sure, because no one's ever said to me, Fred, could you please pay a little faster? I mean, that's not happened, but sometimes I feel like I'm holding the group up. Right. I had a question, uh, just that exact same question today about, you know, I feel like I'm slowing my group down and sometimes they complain I'm taking too long. But you, you have to think about, are you within the rules? You know, um, I think on the tour, they give you 45 seconds. Um, I don't I don't know what the USGA uh, uh, ruling is on it, but on the putting green, I believe it's 45 seconds once it's your turn to play. You can read the putt. Certainly why other people are putting, you can get your plan and your read and kind of get committed, maybe do a little visualization before it's your turn. Then it's just a matter of um, going through, um, you know, the, the final parts of the routine. So once you get this, I think the biggest part for golfers is is they stalk the green a lot. That can take quite a bit of time. But once you get your read and it's your turn to go, it can be very quick. Yeah. Yeah, and ready golf. Making. Ready, ready golf is just critical, right? Yeah, it's the decision making that's critical. I think golfers are better with their routines in putting um, than they are with with the full shot. Um, I, I don't know why. Maybe just because there's less happening uh, with the putter. Uh, it's more of a defined area, and they know they have to read the green and, and make a decision on the read. Um, there's a lot of other factors I think that go into the ball striking routine in terms of wind, lie, club selection, target selection. So there might be more elements that make it difficult for them to have a consistent routine with um, the full shot. Well, what I find so interesting is on a full shot versus a put, uh, putt is that the target is so much smaller with the putt. It, your target is so well defined with a full shot. You know, I've got that much room, you know, and it, as you get closer to the green, your target gets smaller and smaller. So I would think that the putt would uh, induce more anxiety than any other swing or not. Well, yes, with some golfers, absolutely. It's more the finality of it. This is a, this six footer is the difference between, you know, one stroke and two strokes. Right. So there are some golfers that get closer to the hole. There's more anxiety for them about it because, you know, you can hit a 250 yard drive, but then on a six footer, the last six feet is going to determine your score for the hole. And, and that can be unsettling for some golfers, you know, as they get closer to the hole. But not in all cases. Um, I, I find that sometimes it, it can be the opposite where they're trying so hard to hit it close. They're trying so hard to um, uh, get on the green that they put pressure on the other areas of their game as well, all the way back to the driver. So I got to get a I got to get a big drive there so I can get a short iron into the green. Yeah, I had a round recently where I was playing on a, a short par four that kind of bends to the right, which which favored my my drive, and my drive left me right in the middle of the fairway, seventy yards from the pin. So that's the first shot, and it took me six more shots to get the ball in the cup. Yeah. And, yep. and then I feel like now I'm rushing and I'm holding everyone up and I'm not going through my routine and I just, it just goes on forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was driving me crazy. Um, and, and those are the times that I get the most frustrated when I feel like, and I know that when I start rushing, my game just falls apart because I'm like, I'm, I'm rushing. I'm right. And I feel pressured and I just don't play as well. I don't, I'm not enjoying it as much. I'm not, you know, relaxed enough. And I got to believe that I'm not the only one that feels that way. No, I hear it a lot, even from high level golfers. When oh, you're really? rushing, certainly when you're rushing, you're either anxious or you're frustrated and it's like, get me out of here. So anytime <laughs> yes, you're rushing, <laughs> whatever the reason you're rushing, it's, it, it's not good for the game. In other words, because when you rush, you skip the most important part of your routine or your pre-shot routine. And that's the decision making. You just get up to that chip as quick as you can. I got to get this over with. You know, I'm, I'm holding everybody up. I'm making a fool of myself. Let's get up there and, and get it next to the hole so I can get out of here. You don't make good decisions. You don't plan the shot. You don't think through the shot. You don't see a target or a landing area where you want to put the ball. Um, and then you get up over it and it's just there, there's no, 
There's nothing driving the cart there. To me, there's always two parts of the routine, two general areas I talk about, and then I break it down further. But there's a planning and programming stage, and then there's the procedural stage over the ball of aim and align and, and executing the shot, of course. But when you skip the planning and programming uh, parts of the routine when you're rushing, that's when things can really start to break down. Interesting. So, Dr. Cohn, um, <laughs> I'm curious, do you have a mapped out pre-shot routine that you like to um, to work from or is everybody unique? Or do you say, you know what, this, this is, I think would work for you or this is how I like to do it? And can you help us through that? Well, it's a great point. I have a template that I use that okay. I modify for my students. Now, uh, he, the difference, I think, Fred, is you have to understand your, what I call your predominant learning modality or your predominant performance modality. They're one and the same. If you're a visual learner and performer, then we have to build that into the routine, right? Um, if you're more of a... Well, wait a minute. I'm going to stop you. What does that mean? If okay. you're, you have to build that into the if you're a visual... Well, I'll make it simple. Some people see lines uh, and, and can react to lines are very good. You know, the line just sticks out at them. Oh, I see the line. They look at the green. They see a line. That's a visual performer. Okay. Um, not everybody has that ability. Um, I remember I was working with um, Grant Waite uh, one year at Bay Hill. And uh, this is, I think, um, before he had won. But we were talking about um, um, his routine and we we're talking about visualizing shots. And he says to me, you know, everybody talks about visualizing shots and seeing the ball fly through the air. And he says, I can't do that. Mm. And I said, you know what? Not everybody can do that. <laughs> I said, it's okay to just feel the ball flight or feel the shot that you want to hit. You're more of a, a feel or a kinesthetic player, and that's perfectly acceptable. And that was like a huge relief for him. Oh, I bet. I told him he didn't have to visualize the shot because you hear so much about Jack Nicholas talking about, you know, going to the movies in his head and visualizing the shot, but not everybody is a visual performer. And so that's the place that you have to start with when structuring the routine uh, and thinking about the routine is what type of performer are you? How, what's your preference in terms of speed, you know, or pacing of the routine? Um, and what are the idiosyncrasies, uh, idiosyncrasies that you have in terms of, you know, maybe tugging up your pant leg or you see a lot of guys tugging on their um, sleeves, pulling up their sleeves and yep. things like that. So it, it's very individualized in terms of those type of things. But fr from the overall um, structure of the mental preparation, um, I have a general template that I like to start with. Yeah, I was going to say, so let's go back to your template because I in interrupted you and I apologize. So let's go back to the template. Let's go back to the template. Okay, so I would want to start with what you do. So if we're on the putting green, Fred, I would... Uh, I usually have like a two hour putting green. I take a uh, two hour putting clinic that I take my students through strictly on the mental game wow. and, and practice. And so I would ask you, you know, let, let's put a ball down from 10 feet. Talk me through and walk me through what your routine is. So I, I don't know if you want to participate in this, <laughs> this uh, in this forum, but. Um, that's where I would start with you is give me a feel, show me what it would look like and, and, and talk, tell me what's in your mind when you're going through the routine. So I always start from the perspective of what are you doing? First of all, you, I'll, I'll play. You want to do this? I'll do it. Sure. Okay. Go ahead and ask. <laughs> Where should I start? That 10 footer on the course, when you're on okay. the course, uh -huh. um, let, let's say it's a standard, you know, little right to left 10 footer. How would you approach that? What would your routine be and how would you think? Okay. So, what, what I would, think? I'd start with, I'll take you through my routine. I'll start with, I'll put my uh, marker behind the ball, but I'll leave the ball there unless it's blocking somebody. I'll go to the opposite side of the pin and look at, um, you know, look at the line from the ball to the hole 
and and but then take a scan from left to right over the entire green and see if I can read which way the green is going to roll left or right if you know from where my ball is coming and I'll try to draw a line from my ball to the hole um, and not I'm not the kind of guy that says, okay, I'm three inches outside the hole. I'll try to find the point where the ball is going to hit the, its apex and then break back towards the hole, right? And mm-hmm. I also will, I also look at like the last 12 to 24 inches um, where the ball's coming from before it goes in the hole. Then I'll walk back around to my ball. I'll get behind. Oh, oh no. What I'll do is I'll, I'll start at the hole and I'll walk to my ball and count the amount of steps that I have and figure how many feet do I have to, to make that putt. Then I'll get behind my ball and I'll, again, try to find a line and see if it's consistent with what I had on the other side. And I'll, I'll make this line in my mind of where the ball is going to go. And then I will take the ball that I have drawn a line around the ball. I mark my ball with a, with a line on it and I'll line up where I think the ball is going to start heading. I'll put that line, um, and then I'll step over the ball. I'll step behind the ball, take a couple practice swings, looking at the hole the whole time, um, just swinging on what I think the feel is going to be to get the ball there, right? Just like f- faking a practice shot, doing a free throw. So I'll just, you know, take a couple swings. Then I'll step up to the ball and I'll put my feet um, parallel to the line that's on the ball. I'll look over at the hole and I'll follow that line from the hole to my ball trying to see what the pace is of what the ball is going to do, uh, you know, just by, with my eyes visualizing it all the way to my ball. Then I'll step up uh, with my feet together. I will, again, now I'll make a right angle from that line on the ball um, to make sure that my feet are in the same line. Um, once again, I will look at the hole, follow it back to my, all the way to my putter, and then with an equal force, bring the putter back and then make my putt. <laughs> wow. So now you see why I think I'm going too long. <laughs> now you think it's like, am I, am I, are, are they bringing the straight drag jacket out for you? or what? <laughs> you asked, I, I can tell you're, you, you have the tendency to overanalyze your game just from how you describe that to me. Um, because it's very detailed oriented, a lot more detail, but you know, you're in the business of the the communication business, so um, maybe that, that that that's part of it as well. <laughs> you able to voice that to me, all that. Um, you know, usually I'll say, usually I'll say, if you're a student, well, that's great. We can work with that. <laughs> we can work with that, Fred. <laughs> so let's talk about what to do. Should I be lying down when I explain this to you? <laughs> no. So, um. And notice that a lot of what you described were, were, were uh, the physical components of, of what you're doing. You certainly did talk about drawing lines and, mm-hmm. you know, and trying to, uh, you know, see the line and all that, which is all very good. Uh, the one thing I wanted to comment before we get in, into the specific routine is I never want my students to count off and pace off a putt because um, – I never want you to hit a 20 footer or a 30 footer or a 35 footer or a 10 footer. Um, because I want that to be, I want that to be instinctive. I want that to be your natural touch, your natural targeting mechanism to take over that. The, the, the problem that could lead to is, is you start stroking it for a 15 footer. You start stroking it for a 20 footer. Um, uh, and to me, that's not, trusting your touch and your your innate ability to control your speed and i see it as just more input more input yeah um certainly could be uh certainly could be but as long as you're not trying to stroke a 20 footer <laughs> or da- a little downhill a little uphill 20 footer this is how this is how much i have to take the putter back no I, to me it's like okay so what does it feel like to, you know it's like okay this is supposed to feel like 20 footer or you know i actually recently it's so funny you say that because i recently uh have made two putts that were um i thought pretty long putts for me one was about 25 feet actually it's 24 and another one was about 60 plus feet and just before i hit it i go okay this is a 64 footer and I was playing, you know, my son looked at me like, what are you doing? Shut up. And it went in. 
And I was like, I needed to tell myself that that's, I'm going to have to hit this one uphill 60 feet and I got to bring it to, so, um, to me, that's just added input to tell my body, this is what it's going to feel like. And how is your touch generally with that? Do you three putt often? No. Okay. As long as it's it's additional input and you're not you're not putting a sixty foot stroke on it, if you understand what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, because I want people to rely on their touch and their natural targeting mechanisms to drive the distance rather than a specific distance. So you're doing a lot of good things. Um, you're going to both sides, certainly. <laughs> but I'm doing tr- too much. <laughs> well, no, I said the tendency, I think, is to, for you, just listening to you, the tendency is to overanalyze and maybe second guess. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean that you do it, but that's your tendency. Whereas uh, other golfers, it could be to leave, leave important details out, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. On the other end of the spectrum. So the first part is, it, for me, is uh, for my students is to get a read and do the things that you're doing to get a read, looking at both sides of the hole, never from the side. It's always on the line that you want to look at. And then you want to make that decision. I, I call it using your imagination to see the line. So you drew a line. I don't know if you've ever uh, saw that commercial that Tiger Woods did where uh, maybe it was an Accenture. I'm, I'm not sure, but he'd be hitting putts in his mind and they would miss and they would miss. So he's pre-playing the putts and then finally one goes in and then he steps over the ball, you know, and hits the putt. So I teach my golfers to pre-play the putt with their imagination. If you were, you know, standing up over the ball and you hit the putt from that location, can you see the ball, the line and the track it's going to take? And so I ask my students to do that on both sides of the hole and hopefully, you know, come to um, an agreement that it looks the same on both sides. That's obviously the best. The most important aspect of the mental routine is once you get your line, Fred, that you're fully committed to carrying out that plan. Yeah. You're seeing it. You're Absolutely. locked into the line. It's like, I call it lock on, like laser lock on. Um, you're not letting that plan um, deviate from your mind as you go up and approach the ball. And that's the, the challenge for golfers is they'll get a read from behind, which is the right place to read the putt from. They'll get up over the ball and their eyes are in a different position. They're in a different position. And now it starts to feel and look a little bit different to them. Yep. So they'll change their mind at the last second and they'll play a little more break or a little bit less break. And that, that second guessing and indecision is, uh, is, uh, golfer's worst enemy. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. I know that, um, sometimes when I step over the ball, all of a sudden it looks like a completely different line, like it's going to break differently. And that's when I, what I like to call a mental mulligan. Where I just step away from the ball, like, okay, I'm not going to get charged on my scorecard for this mulligan, but I'm going to walk away and start again because, like, wait a minute, that's not right. So I, it breaks my confidence. It breaks my, my thought process, right? Yeah, and you're doing absolutely the right thing. You're saying, well, wait a second. I've got two lines in my mind. i got to step away and yeah. get decided here. Yeah. That's the planning and programming stage. The planning and programming stage is you're getting a, a, the read, you're committing to the read, you're seeing the last two feet of it, which is great. That's a great image. How the ball is traveling into the hole. Is it coming in at, you know, uh, six o'clock? Is it coming in at, um, nine o'clock? Where's, where's the ball coming in at? Yeah. And it's a wonderful, wonderful image. Then, to me, after the planning and programming, once you step up to the ball, it's simple procedure. But when I say simple procedure, there's some other uh, what I call mental game elements that are important. Number one, it's to focus on the execution or what I call the process. Um, and number two, it's to have trust in your stroke and not guide it and steer it and tighten up, yip at it or, or, or whatever. Um, so the, to me, those are the important mental elements. That's the template that I teach, but I try to work within the the framework of your routine, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. your current routine. Fabulous. Well, I listen, I know that you have a lesson coming up in a couple minutes and you've got to go. So um, I'm going to cut this off here. This has been amazing. I really, um, I enjoyed talking to you about this and helping myself and learning more about my own problems. Um, but <laughs> tell me again, uh, website where we can find more information about you. 
and what your stuff is? The mothership is at peaksports.com. That's peak, P E A K, sports.com. Mm-hmm. The, the golf podcast is the Golf Psychology Podcast. And you can certainly find that on uh, on iTunes or um, on my blog site sure. as well at peaksports.com. Yeah, and um, there will be uh, links in the uh, show notes of golfsmarter.com to this conversation. Uh, Patrick, it was really um, great to speak with you. Hopefully, I'll get a chance to be on your podcast at some point as well. And you can keep picking my brain <laughs> so I can find out more about this. Because I, I actually would like to talk to you about the post shot routine, too. Excellent. Well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll send you the bill for the putting lesson today. <laughs> <laughs>